Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining. We're just going to wait a few minutes to let everybody filter in. Well, welcome, welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you could join us today for Election 2020 Countdown. Social workers can get out the vote. My name is Patrick Dunn. I am the Vice President of Communications and Marketing for the Council on Social Work Education, and we are so glad that you could all join us today. We've been looking forward to this webinar for quite some time and want to thank the Voting is Social Work campaign and their team and volunteers for all of their efforts. My role will be to introduce our speakers today and we have some great ones lined up. So with no further delay, I would like to introduce Darla Spence Coffey, the president and CEO of CSWE. Thank you, Patrick. First, I just wanna say thank you um, to everybody who is on this uh, webinar, um, the team that has worked together to develop and produce this webinar, it's been a fabulous collaboration. So good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Welcome to this first collaborative web webinar between CSWE and Voting is Social Work. We've used the word unprecedented way too many times this year, but I've been thinking that it's still a very apt way to describe the importance of the upcoming election in November. The entire House of Representatives, many Senate seats, and the White House are all in play. No matter which candidate, social workers, students, educators, or our clients choose to support, it is incredibly important that everyone be able to exercise their right to vote. This is a right that people have fought hard for and won. It is precious and we need to make sure that all of us feel empowered to exercise that right. As social workers and students and faculty at social work programs, we've got an incredible opportunity to make sure that everyone who is registered to vote actually does that this year and in future elections. This is not just about 2020, it's 2020 and beyond. Think of all the people that we interact with on a weekly basis. Our colleagues and the faculty, our students, and if you're a student, your classmates, those that we work with in our field placements. It's been said that social workers interact with millions of people each day. Think about the power that we have to mobilize the group of people, the, the millions of people that we interact with. We can use those interactions to help people to register and to exercise their vote. Voting is so important for so many reasons. Our lives are dependent on who is elected into political positions. However, voting allows us to have a say in how our state, local, and federal governments function. There are important initiatives that are only found on ballots. For example, I live in the state of Virginia. In November, Virginia voters will decide how our state and congressional districts are drawn. Currently, these, these boundaries are set by the General Assembly. Some districts have been subject to gerrymandering in the past. This practice uh, marginalizes and disenfranchises people. The ballot initiative creates a commission of lawmakers and residents that will draw those lines so that they are fair and people's vote gets counted. This is just one example of the many decisions made at the polls and why it's so important for us to be registered and to vote. The other day I was behind a car and I was struck by a bumper sticker, which is why I have this particular background. And the bumper sticker says, vote like your rights depend on it. And in that moment, it actually resonated more than the phrase that I've heard, vote like your life depends on it. Because in the end, our life isn't worth anything unless we have the rights to live the kind of life we choose to live. I think that's a good way to sum up the importance of this election. So today we're going to talk about how to drive people to vote like their lives and their rights depend on it. We'll learn how to impartially and in an unpartisan way encourage people to register to vote. We'll hear from faculty talk about what their programs have been doing to increase voter registration and to support voters. We will hear from voting rights activists about what can be done, and we'll get a tour of the Voting as Social Work campaign. They've got a many great resources that you need to check out that will make it easy for programs to register people to vote. I hope you can join us in mobilizing people to exercise this right in November and in the future. Talk to your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, whomever it is that you come in contact with. This is so important that CSWE has made the decision that we're actually going to close our office on election day to support our staff to not only vote, 
but to volunteer their time and efforts to make voting a good experience for everyone. Please consider doing the same thing if you've got the position to be able to do that. So thank you again for joining us today. We're so pleased to have you and I'm gonna pass this right back to Patrick, thank you. Thank you, Darla. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Sandra Starks to talk about social work programs and voting. Sandra is the chair of the board of directors of CSWE. and She is also the MSW program director at Western Kentucky University. Sandra, thank you so much for joining us today. It, it would help if you had my voice, right? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, colleagues, for uh, this wonderful opportunity. I bring you greetings from the CSWE Board of Directors and from the Social Work Program at Western Kentucky University. There, I tell my students, there could not be a more difficult, challenging time to be a social work student, a social work educator, and a social worker, but also there could not be a better time to be involved in what brought most of us into the profession. I also bring you greetings from the great state of Kentucky. In spite of the continued struggles with injustices and the things that right now have us on the map, that's getting everybody's attention as rightly it should be. Um, I want you to know that social workers all over our state, this state are focused on the changes that need, it, need to happen. And that we know that we can be the catalyst that brings about a more equal, and just commonwealth and country. We're about to attempt to elect our local, state, and federal lawmakers during this global pandemic that so far has claimed more than 200,000 lives here in America. Also during a racial pandemic that's claimed way more lives than we even know what the data, what the stats are. So, we're headed to the polls during these times of social justice awakenings, reckonings, and activism. But we always think about as social workers, with crisis comes opportunity. Opportunity that motivates us even more to get out that vote, to take the fight to the ballot. And I'm reminded to, I added this in, to a quote by John Lewis, another one of our amazing human rights, human justice champions that we lost this year. And he said, the vote is precious. The vote is sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have as a democracy. So we need to act now. If you take just a few key points from today's webinar, please know how quickly that we all need to work. Time is precious. In fact, in many states, the deadline to register is next week. The deadline to vote in Kentucky is October 5th. And the deadline here to request a mail-in ballot is October 9th. It is so important that we exercise our right to vote and ensure that others who are less fortunate and more marginalized than we are have the right to vote and have the access uh, to the voting polls. And we know as social workers, there are so many barriers that keep people from the polls, especially the poor, women, people of color, basically those that are disenfranchised in our communities. So at Western Kentucky University, we're located in South Central Kentucky. Our students are really busy working through social media, in their classes, in their student organizations, with our campus and local communities, because we're a community um, university and we're very much in our communities, assisting with voter registration projects, and they're beginning to connect the dots, our students are, between social work values and the actions needed to realize those values. And that means voting and registering people to vote. So they're involved in campus protests, community protest marches, and in just about every one of those, there's been a voter registration component of it, which is so important. So all over Kentucky, I think our programs and our schools are partnering with their communities to begin to create this change. But why is this voting so important? Because the way we change the system of racism and move the arc of social justice is through the voting process. In this election, there is too much at stake. Healthcare, women's rights, reproductive freedoms, environmental issues, immigration rights, people of color issues, and that's just to name a few. 
This is our chance to vote our social work ethics and values. This is our chance to make a difference. And don't let anybody tell you that your vote does not matter. Because of the more than 120,000 million, no, it was a million votes cast in the 2016 election, 107,000 votes in three states really decided that election. And those states were Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. In 2000, George W. Bush was elected by just 537 votes in Florida after the recounts and paved a pathway to the presidency. So each and every single vote matters and is important. So we're so grateful that you're here with us today to get these resources and this information. And we hope you take these lessons and work quickly and work hard to turn out voters this year. We are many voices, but we're all in the same choir. Please join with us in making this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for your thoughts. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Mimi Abramowitz to tell us more about the Voting and Social Work campaign. Mimi is a faculty member at the Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College, and she's also with the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign. Uh, Mimi, take it away. to thank CSWEO. So, did you unmute me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, because it said I got a message. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to start over. So first I would like to thank uh, CSWE for hosting this webinar. The campaign could not have done it without them and working with Patrick and Marianne has been a terrific experience for us. A, a great collaboration, teamwork, um, all those words that are our favorite words. I also want to uh, thank the attendees, all those over 200 people, as I can figure out now, are on this call. Thank you all for joining us because we couldn't do this work without you. This was the idea was that we together will mobilize the social work community. And I'd like to say that in addition to the two leaders from the Council on Social Work Education, your speakers include all the co-leaders of the national campaign national social work mobilization campaign. So I just want you to know that we, uh, we mobilized our forces um, for today and hope we all have a good time and learn a lot. So I don't really have to tell this audience that social workers have always understood that voting supports a robust democracy, a just society, and an equitable social welfare system. But this requires, as you've already heard, an accessible and inclusive electoral process. Sounds simple? Right. Makes sense? Right. Yet, it took the civil rights, the women's rights, and other social movements to get us here. Many gave their lives to win the vote. However, I'm sad to say today that what was done is being undone. As you know, mean-spirited voter suppression tactics are widespread across the country. They are intended to demoralize the electorate, to make people believe the system is rigged, that their vote does not matter and does not count. Therefore, the National Social Work Mobilization Campaign, our nickname is Voting is Social Work, is more than thrilled to be working with CSWE and many other major social work organizations to register students, faculty, staff, and clients to vote, and now as we head into November to get out the vote. In 2016, we launched this nonpartisan campaign to mobilize voters and to integrate voter engagement into social work education. With amazing speed, we won the endorsements from all the major social work organizations including CSWE, as well as many state NASW chapters, BSW, MSW programs, social service agencies, we were stunned at how quickly people signed on, which as you know, if you're a member of an organization, it's very hard to get approval that quickly, a sign of the times. Since then, our largely volunteer and unfunded campaign has uh, connected with thousands of social workers around the country. How do we do this? We use our website, which you will see soon, shortly, social media, email, and personal outreach. NASW and CSWE, the social media offices have been, put to, have been helping us out. 
have been really, really helpful on this front. We believe we helped to register thousands of voters in 2018, and are hopefully the same for 2020, and then of course, get everyone out to vote. COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement have simply upped the ante. Together they have exposed major race, gender, and class cracks in our society that place our election system, if not democracy itself, at risk. So our campaign has four main purposes. First, we wanna raise awareness of the importance of voting to social right practice, social policy, and social justice. Second, we wanna mobilize and train faculty, students, and field staff to register the people they work with to vote, especially those targeted by voter suppression, gerrymandering, and gerrymandering. Third, we want to ref refute the myths that discourage social workers from registering the voters. And thanks to the CSWE emails, that many of those myths have been posted on and refuted on so uh, your social media. And finally, we want to integrate voting and civic and civic engagement into social work education. I will end with six reasons why we do this. One, it is simply the right thing to do. Second, we are in the right place. Think of our, our field placement model. It positions us so well to do this work. We sit at the intersection of the individual and society every day. We are well positioned to register people to vote and get out the vote. According to Angelo McLean, the chief executive author of NASW, social workers see some 12 million clients every day. Less than 25% are registered to vote, and many are targets of voter suppression. Therefore, field work, we made field work the hub, the centerpiece of our campaign, and you'll be hearing about that shortly. Third, Voting brings benefits to individuals, communities, and the social work profession. For individuals, voting is associated with higher levels of health and mental health, stronger social connections, better employment outcomes, and a greater sense of efficacy. For communities, those rate with higher voter turnout receive more attention, responses, and resources from legislation than communities with lower turnout, and Darla made this point earlier. For the profession, voting elevates our visibility and voice in support of policies and programs that benefits our clients and wider society, as Sandra so eloquently told us. Fourth, we have a long track record dating back to the 30s, the 60s, and the 90s. Some of you may remember that in 1980 and 1990, Richard Cloward, a social worker for Columbia University, and Francis Piven, his, a sociologist organized the Human Serve campaign to register social agency clients to vote. We stand on their shoulders. They didn't even have email. They also, um, they also helped pass the National Voter Registration Act in 1954, popularly known, at, popularly known as the Motor Voter Act. It was signed by President Clinton and authorized voter registration at motor vehicle bureaus but also, thanks to uh, Cloward and Piven, to uh, public assistance offices. They recognize that not everyone has a car. Uh, fifth, uh, voting, uh, uh, voting, uh, mobilizing the vote supports social work values and con contributes to our social justice mission. Six, voting is more important than ever today. As Darla said, vote like your rights depend on it. Be part of history. Join the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign and go to our website, Voting is Social Work, which you will also get a tour of shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. And now I'd like to invite Tanya Rhodes-Smith and Sunita Buke Gallo to take us on a tour of the Voting is Social Work website and those resources. Uh, both Tanya and Cindy are with the Nancy A. Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work at the University of Connecticut. So uh, Tanya and Cindy, take it away. Uh, I was born in 1968 and- So young. Um, I, <laughs> yep, so young. <laughs> and I'm, I feel very much this, I'm also the son of immigrants. And so I feel very much this sense of generational obligation. I basically, have done nothing. I won the lottery being born in this country when I was born. 
Uh, I didn't have to do any of the things that you've had to do. I didn't have to do any, make any of the choices that you had to make. Uh, and I, I want you to, I would like you to explain to people, not only my age, but to the young, young people uh, in the room, um, how it is that we should define this generation's challenges that we should be willing to put ourselves completely on the line for, uh, and how we in this age where it's not as stark as troopers standing on the bridge every day, how does this rising generation find and summon that same courage to stand up and fight the way that, um, that you did, Congressman? Well, I must tell you, uh, you're much better educated, you're better informed, you know, all this new technology. We didn't have a fax machine. We had one of these old mimograph machines, just turn and turn. You have an obligation, your generation, young people have an obligation, a mission, and a mandate to push and pull and not be satisfied and do everything possible. I tell young people all the time, I spoke at seven college graduation this past season, and I said, the, the three young men that I met and got to know, they didn't die in Vietnam or the Middle East or Eastern Europe or Central South America or in Africa. They died right here in our own country. And I hear too many people say, I'm not gonna participate. That's not my cause, that's not, we have to participate. Politics control everything that we do in America, from the time that we're born into the time we die. So you have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate to get out there and push and do everything you can to leave this little piece of real estate we call America a little greener, a little cleaner, and a little more peaceful for generation yet unborn. Uh, I Sorry about that. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be with you today. Um, my name is Tanya Rhodes Smith. Um, I go by she, her, hers. And we are here to talk to you a little bit about um, what we've learned at the Humphreys Institute. Nancy Humphreys um, believed in this work and started encouraging students to do agency based voter registration at their field placements. Um, for over two decades ago. And so what we wanted to do was to share a little bit about what we've learned in terms of integrating this into curriculum and field education and show you the website because um, it's, it's not always, uh, there's a lot of, of work to be done out there and there are a lot of resources, but sometimes it can be really overwhelming. So before I turn it over to Cindy to show you, to the web, um, show you the website, I wanted to say a couple of things. One, um, who votes matters in an inclusive democracy. An inclusive democracy responds to the needs of all individuals. And, and while this is urgent work, um, it's also with, with the election coming, it's also long-term work. And I want to mention one thing and that the census, the 2020 census is now scheduled to end October 6th. So it's um, critically important. We're not here to talk about that, but I did wanna mention that. And we know what the problem is. You know, more people stayed home than voted for either candidate in the last election. And we know that turnout for state and local elections is even lower. And that's really important to the outcomes of um, the communities that we serve. And we know through studies like the Knight Foundation that non-voters are likely to be um, lower income, have low, um, less education, they're more likely to be non-white, unmarried. And, and we also know a little bit about them. They, they're more likely to believe the system is rigged. Um, they're more likely to be passive uh, users of news um, and information, and they are often really ignored by campaigns. And I know we'll talk about those structural barriers, but I wanna emphasize something that these structural barriers really feed this intentional myth or these, is na this national narrative that your vote doesn't matter. And so it's very complicated, which is one of the reasons why um, people are reluctant to encourage people to vote. They're very worried about partisanship or getting the, the rules wrong. I mean, we have 50 states, 50 rules. Elections are hyper-local. They are different. It's a different experience, whether you're voting in a community that has high rates of home ownership versus communities that are more 
highly mobile. So, and we, we have, documentation to prove that that there are, it's also um, discriminatory in the way that we apply or the way that we hold elections if you live in communities for example that have higher rates of african americans or latinx populations you're more likely to stand in line so it's important to know that a lot of people don't at least 40 percent of the people who don't vote don't do so because of an engagement barrier my vote doesn't matter the system is rigged um, they've never been asked. You know, those are that. This is really important space for us. And and what we've learned at the Humphreys Institute, and I'm really lucky to work with um, folks like Shannon Lane and Dr. Mary Hilton and others. But what we know over years is that the shoulds and the hows aren't enough, and that we really have to um, integrate the why. That voting is a social determinant of health. That it is a human right. It is central to empowerment practice. And as, um, as we've already you know, heard, it's really the most important tool we have to achieve social justice, racial justice, and economic justice. And it, it, it connects directly to our work and our impact as social workers. So we teach it as this micro, meso, and macro um, intervention at all levels of social work practice. It aligns with all of the core competencies. We encourage students to really integrate it and get practice in field as we were talking about field as the hub. And we really give them a vision of what it would look like if social workers and we help them operationalize it. And that's, these are some of the tools that you'll find on the website. The operationalizing it into practice is also really important. How, do, how does this look if you're a school social worker? How does it look if you work in a healthcare clinic? How do you stay nonpartisan? And how do you get the information that you need about the rules, which again, are different in all 50 states? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Cindy Dubuque Gallo, and I guess I have to stop sharing, don't I, Cindy, for you to be able to take over. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I'm looking forward to showing everyone the website that we have all worked on together. As you'll see here, this is the homepage of the Voting and Social Work website, which is been created with social workers in mind. We laid this out uh, to be functional, while informative, it is iterative, collaborative, and seeks to be a one-stop clearinghouse of information for social workers. So on the homepage, you'll see our vision here. You'll see the top menu bar with the drop downs, And then we have a bunch of tools here that bring you right to check your registration. I hope everybody checked their registration and made sure that they are registered to vote, um, as well as we have information on ordering absentee ballots and specifically looking at groups who may have an emergency hospitalization, those who may be in skilled nursing facilities or long-term care centers, those who are in the military or living overseas, as well as those who are veterans or speak a language other than English. We also focus on registering po special populations. And this includes folks that you might be working with, such as those who may have a felony conviction, those who are experiencing homelessness, um, and those who might have uh, been experiencing domestic violence or sexual assault. You'll also see here that we've got some state specific resources and we'd love to see what resources you have to share with us that we could put on this website. We're highly collaborative and want you to be part of this process. We've partnered with Social Work and Vote ER, which really focuses on uh, registering people to vote in medical and uh, clinical settings. And we have a link to our partner Social Work Votes. And then there's some other ways to get involved as well. And then you'll see we've got some articles here uh, voting in the news, as well as upcoming events. And if you haven't already, please join our mailing list by uh, signing up here today, and then you could pledge to be part of the campaign by clicking here. So up top, you'll see as well under voting resources that we have a section on Know Your Rights. And this is important to understanding uh, about voter suppression and what you can do to make sure that the your right to vote is not infringed upon. We have some information about those who are experiencing um, disabilities. And then under campaign resources, we really geared this to social work audiences. So for example, for schools of social work, here we have best practices for you that you can uh, utilize to add to your curriculum. We have um, activities to put in educational contracts, we have uh, fact sheets. One of them that I'm gonna draw your attention to is the role of social workers in voter turnout and schools and agencies. And this really highlights 
um, you know, why vote, the barriers that people face, how you can make a difference, uh, the benefits of voting, and uh, perhaps your organization would like to join our list of growing endorsements as well. In addition to that, we have um, additional information about uh, engaging field agencies and um, sharing ideas about how uh, you can incorporate voter engagement into field placements. For students, I saw there are a lot of students on this webinar and I think it's great that there's so much interest and activism there. We have some simple steps that you could use to participate in voter engagement, as well as a list of ways that you can get involved with resources. Each of these are highlighted here. Here's a voter registration drive checklist. In addition, some basic things did you know? And this website page was um, designed by interns who worked with us over the uh, summer student interns from, I think it was the University of Denver. Tanya can correct me if I'm wrong about that as well as highlights of students who are doing the work in the field. So if you have stories to share, pictures to share, please share them with us. We'd love to bright spot the work that you're doing out in your communities. Under campaign resources for agencies and community organizations, we, we know that it can be challenging to uh, go out there and register voters. There's some concerns about that. So we have this do's and don'ts of staying nonpartisan and information on knowing the facts. Also, if you're sitting with a client, we have this QR code here. You could put your phone up to this. It'll take you right to the Voting and Social Work website and you can easily register people to vote. There's also a link to uh, Vote ER and some additional information on what you might wanna say to folks to get them to register to vote. The other thing that would be useful to organizations and schools is this know the nonpartisan facts. And there's information here about the Hatch Act, the Notar National Voter Registration Act, and additional resources down here, particularly related to the VA and registering uh, veterans as well. And then I wanna show you field education. I know that uh, Beth and Melissa will be talking about field education, because that really is like the hub of social work. And we have this great list of assignments for um, field, that you can use for your students and your placements, as well as um, the checklist that Tanya saw, showed you with the nine core competencies. The last thing I'm gonna share with you real quick is our list of resources, which we organize. We have documentaries, we have articles about the benefits of civic engagement, books, podcasts, and all other sorts of media. So I invite you to uh, check out the website. Uh, we're collaborative, so send us some information and we'll be happy to um, put what we can up there. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya and Cindy. Uh, it is a resource full, uh, a website full of resources. Um, they're helpful, they're easy to use, they're designed to be you know, pulled right off the website and implemented. So thanks for walking us through that. Uh, as mentioned, you know, field work is so important to not just social work education, but really any voter registration effort. Um, and Mimi has uh, repeatedly said that field is the hub of good voter engagement programs. So our next two speakers are going to talk about some updates from uh, field work. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Melissa Reidmeyer with the University of South Carolina. And she is also the CSWE uh, Council on Field Education Chair. Melissa, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Patrick. I really appreciate the, the nice introduction. I just have to say first, I'm so inspired to see so many students on the call. Uh, it's just fantastic that there is such participation with 250 people. Um, it's very inspiring, especially as a chair on the Council on Field Education for CSWE. It's, it's very heartening to see such participation because you guys are our workforce. You're our next uh, round of social workers entering the workforce and you're on the cutting edge. You're in a very historical moment right now um, with voting, with uh, racism as Sandra Starks was talking about earlier and then the COVID pandemic. We have a lot happening and so your participation is so important and critical at this point. Um, I would like to just reiterate that field education is the hub of this campaign and field education is the signature pedagogy. This is where you become and evolve into a social worker. Your civic engagement is so important to getting the vote out. 
Um, the thing that I'm most proud of and inspired by is the work of the Voting and Social Work Campaign. I actually have not um, been a part of that so much as I want to really give a great heartfelt uh, welcome to the field subgroup that really worked hard with so many wonderful field programs across the nation to develop a great toolkit of resources for field programs. We have over 800 CSWE accredited programs, both MSW and VSW, um, that are helping students evolve into that professional social worker, whether at a bachelor level or master level social worker. And now is the time. We have a responsibility, not for you to clock hours, but to develop meaningful competencies that are defined by CSW and our standards. And this work group has really put a lot of time and effort into assisting our huge volunteer field instructor network to provide or maybe even assist students in developing competencies and practice behaviors as they work towards civic engagement, specifically voting. Um, I will say that there's an opportunity here to really build important skills, values, and knowledge, but specifically those competencies and also tie maybe hours towards attainment of those competencies. I just want to mention real quick that there was the field group with, with folks from Mississippi, Bryn Mawr, George Mason, Silverman School of Social Work and University of Montana, but this was led by Dr. Beth Lewis, who I have the honor of introducing next. She really has put a lot of heart into this and enthusiasm so that each of you students on this call, you field educators, directors, uh, there's a lot of interprofessional folks on this call as too, that ways that we can really integrate this work into internships. You know, who is the client? It's not just the individual person, it's the community as well. And this is a real opportunity to engage in meaningful field work in ways that can elevate a specific skill set, but really address some serious social problems um, and political context that are happening in our country right now. So I would really like to give a great welcome to Dr. Beth Lewis. She is the field director at Bryn Mawr, um, out of the Graduate School of Social Work and I believe Social Research. And so I'm really thrilled and on behalf of Kofi, the Council on Field Education, uh, to let her share with you wonderful tools and resources that have been created for our field educator community. So welcome, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. It's a privilege and honor to work with you in this effort, and we appreciate your support and the support of Kofi. Thank you. Uh, so yes, several people have said that field education is the hub. I, I will repeat that. And that's because it's really through the work that social work students carry out in the field that the millions of clients served by social workers every day can be reached. As a field director interested in promoting quality field education, when I learned about this campaign in the fall of 2016, I jumped at the chance to become involved. I saw it as a way to advance students' knowledge of ethical principles of social justice and the dignity and worth of the person, and to also realize in their field work our profession's ethical mandate to engage in social and political action toward the goal of ensuring equal access to resources for all human beings. It was also a natural follow-up to the work that had already begun infusing policy practice and bridging the micro and macro divide in field education through the work of the Special Commission to Advance Macro Practice in Social Work and through the CSWE Policy Practice in Field Education Initiative, which many of you may know uh, had already begun. And like these efforts, I see the integration of voter education and field education as a sustainable component in social work education well beyond 2020. A little about where we've been and where we're going. Um, at the outset of the campaign, we formed a field work group. And I, I do want to acknowledge, um, as Melissa pointed out, uh, the work of colleagues Kaneko Okuda of George Mason University, Becky Sander of Silverman School of Social Work, Patricia Digby of University of Mississippi, and Katerina Werner 
of the University of Montana who formed the uh, field work group. Um, and what we did uh, at the outset was to reach out to our vast field education networks and through them to partnering agencies. And we learned that there was a great deal of interest among agencies in embracing this work, though not always the resources to make it happen. Some agencies saw this work as peripheral to their mission. Some felt that the time and person power was not available, and many expressed the need for more information about what the work actually entailed and how it could be incorporated. We heard that and we responded by providing more concrete examples of learning assignments that can be carried out in the field and encouraging the use of existing forms like student orientation, seminars in field instruction to highlight this work and to lift up the work of the agencies that were already leading in this effort. And over the course of the last two years, um, it's wonderful to see how many agencies have demonstrated how this work can fit with student learning goals and agency missions. And we've seen an increase in the number of students whose learning agreements reflect the goals of voter engagement, which is very exciting. Students are considering ways to have conversations with clients that include this message. Very important. And as we know, more and more students see the importance of civic engagement in the context of the pandemic and the struggle for racial, economic, and social justice. So in addition to the assignments available on the website, which were highlighted by Cindy and Tanya, and which can be used to earn required time in field and to integrate work into field placements, I'd like to just take this opportunity to share a couple of examples of learning agreement goals and tasks from students that will likely be similar to those that students in many programs and field settings can undertake. So uh, in one setting, in work with an older adult community dwelling population, the student's goal was to learn how to promote voting and how it relates to social work. And the tasks associated with that goal were to research the mail-in ballot process, to assist clients, participate in phone banks to remind people to vote, and then my favorite, ask clients why they personally vote and about their first time voting. And I like that because it demonstrates that bridging of micro and macro in the field, which we know uh, is really how practice occurs. Uh, in work, in another setting, in work with individuals and families experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness, the student's goal was to improve their understanding of voters' rights and processes in mail-in registration. And then the tasks associated with that were to attend trainings and to participate in phone banking and facilitating the registration process with this community. In medical case management with adolescent patients, the goal was to learn more about adolescent development and how to engage with patients from various backgrounds. And one of the ways to do that was to facilitate a group session to talk about topics of importance, including voter registration and barriers to voting. In a macro setting community, I'm sorry, county mental health setting, the students a uh, task would be to create a series of emails to send to provider agencies encouraging voter participation and providing helpful voter related information. So these are just some of the, uh, there's many more, I wish I had more time to, uh, to talk about them because they're really wonderful um, in terms of students embracing and really uh, pushing this activity now in their field placements. That's what we're seeing. So in closing, I just want to highlight several strengths in skill building that I see for field education in this campaign going forward. First is that it provides students with skills in facilitating client access to resources, in this case, civic engagement and voting, which are necessary for client and community well-being and then connecting this work with social change. I think that it strengthens students' relationship building skills, as we can see in the, in the learning um, agreements that students are developing with clients, 
with others in the agency and with the community in which the agency exists. It raises student awareness of issues of racial and social injustice, and it provides students with essential knowledge about the history of the struggle for voter rights in this country and what access to the vote means for all of us and for those who will benefit from needed change. And finally, it provides an avenue for future opportunities for faculty and field education collaboration in teaching and developing projects that can be carried out in the classroom and the field. We are doing that this year uh, at my school in the third year of the campaign, and I hope that this work continues in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, for those updates. Uh, now we'd like to hear from a few programs on how they're working to register voters and some of the work that they're doing. Uh, we're glad to welcome Gina McClendon from the Center for Social Development at the Brown School at Washington University, and Catherine Hill from the Morrison Family College of Health School of Social Work at the University of St. Thomas. Gina, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, First, I want to thank, thank everyone for the invitation to be a part of this wonderful panel of people. And then I also want to give a shout out and thanks to um, the, the founders of Voting and Social Work campaign for inviting me to be a part of, of, of the, um, the co-leadership team. So as um, Patrick said, I work at the Center for Social Development in the Brown School of Social Work. And the topic of voting and uh, the upcoming election is a, it's a historical moment in the nation's history for so many reasons. Um, I like the fact that um, there's an intentional focus here today on social work professionals as defenders of democracy, because if you think about it, if not social workers, then who? So I, I think that this is a, um, an appropriate conversation. But I want to, to, before I talk more about um, what we actually do, I wanted you to sort of understand that the Voter Access and Engagement Initiative really has a single focus, is about protecting democracy and the right to vote, um, to build a culture of voting. And for me, the work serves as a way to honor the sacrifices, in, of, um, sacrifices of Blacks and others made in this country, and particularly John Lewis and I mean, the list is infinite. I could just go on and on. So it's a pleasure to be able to pass on that torch of um, that knowledge. So I, I want to share something that happened to me um, because I think this will make my point and show the inspiration behind the, the work that I'm doing. I volunteered as a poll worker on election day in 2008, intentionally working in a community with a high concentration of black voters black like citizens and residents. That day I witnessed many failures, shortages of paper ballots, broken and faulty equipment, the lack of proper assistance for people with disabilities. Unfortunately, the list goes on, long lines, extended wait times. And uh, I thought that these were typical occurrences on election day, something that happens at every polling place because systems fail, procedures fail, things happen, right? But I also saw the excitement in the eyes of hundreds of voters, first time voters who were eager to help make history for, by voting for a black man for president in the United States. I was excited to see so many people, especially young people and particularly young black males. As I passed out water and chatted with voters waiting in line, I thanked them for coming because people uh, like to feel appreciated. I began to ask questions like, is this your first time voting? Most of them, especially the young people, said yes. My follow-up question was, well, why are you voting? And the common response was that um, they wanted Barack Obama. He was going to be the first Black president. And they, as, as a voter, they wanted to be part of that history. My final question was, are you familiar with other electoral races and ballot initiatives? Most said no. I'm only here to vote for Mr. Obama. And that response haunted me for years. You see, I know how to research candidates and grew up in a culture of voting, but I've always known that others did not have what I was taught. I wanted to understand the reasons for that response. Why did voters feel so disconnected from the other cons concerns on the ballot? In all honesty, 
it is not that I didn't get it. You know, um, as black people, we've been disenfranchised with so many things. But I wonder what would make a person become a lifetime voter? What would it take to create a culture of voting in black communities? As the Voter Access and Initiative has, uh, was developed, I often thought about how that work might help people to connect their real issues to voting. How do you build that connection? If people can't connect voting to their daily lives, if they don't think that voting matters or that they matter, and, and have consistently been the target of voter suppression since the ratification of the Constitution, it will always be difficult to maintain a healthy and strong democracy. You see, it's, it's not enough to tell people that casting a ballot on election day is a fundamental right of all eligible voters. More is needed. So that's how the voter access and engagement initiative sort of grew from that realization. So just a little bit about what VA does. We, we have an intentional um, focus, of course, on race, but it's, but it's a ground approach with research and interventions that support voter engagement. So with our research, we did a research in this project in 2018. And uh, basically what we wanted to understand was, um, our, what's, is there access to, what is the access to voting? and voting processes and what do the, do the infrastructures look like? Because I've seen this, but of course you have to have proof. So we, we tested this in 20 different polling locations in St. Louis city and county, and we separated them out by race and income. And um, unfortunately, the results were that, um, that there were deficiencies in voting access and procedures are significantly significantly higher in predominantly black and low income census tracts where the poll sites were located. There are a variety of deficiencies that were illuminated here that I um, won't go into because I'm probably running out of time. But in addition to that research, um, we did things like GIS mapping. Um, we wanted to understand where the concentration of people, where voter turnout was by race. Um, we also um, are looking at absentee. So Missouri recently passed a bill where um, they expanded the, the absentee uh, voting. They included mail-in voting and also one for COVID. So we're taking a look at that data as well. We've done things like training and uh, recruitment. So the Brown School, thanks to our Dean, Dean Mary uh, McKay, has allowed us to um, encourage students, faculty, staff, and alumni to be part of um, the election process and has given them an opportunity to go and become poll workers or work in, with election protection. And uh, if they're staff or faculty, they don't have to use their vacation time, which I think is very, very um, good. We've hosted election protection trainings. We have participated with national groups like um, Common Cause and Demos, their purging table, um, Transformative Justice Coalition, which you'll hear from um, Barbara Armwine in just a second, a little more about that. We held a, um, uh, a march, the John Lewis Good Trouble March, Voter Awareness March, just uh, on September 22nd, trying to again bring awareness to this. We, our campus, we're fortunate to have a Institute, the Gephardt Institute, where they actually engage a lot with students on campus. And so we've worked cooperatively with them. Uh, there, there's more that I can talk about. We've done presentations um, all over the place. But the thing that I wanted to, to mention is that now we're, we are figuring out ways to think about those sort of discussions around election integrity. What could that look like as well as post this post-election discussions as well. So in thinking about what other schools of social work can do and thinking about what students can do, stay tuned, um, be aware that, that there are opportunities to be involved in things more than just um, voter registration. But what does um, election integrity look like? What should it look like? What does the 12th Amendment say about those things? And so um, as we start to develop those um, workshops, we'll be sure to pass that information on. So I'll stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Gina. And Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Gina. That just you're just doing such incredible work. That was so fun to listen to all of those wonderful activities. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more specifically to what we're doing here at the University of St. Thomas. We are in St. Paul, Minnesota, not in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Just to clarify, we're not at we're not at the St. Thomas that everyone wants to come visit in January. We're at the other one, um, or the one in Texas. But anyway, so so um, the way I think about the the work we're doing here at St. Thomas is sort of at a macro, meso, micro level, being a good social worker. Um, at a macro level, we, the School of Social Work, is really acting as a, as a hub and a driver for campus-wide efforts around voter education, education, uh, outreach and engagement. So we actually have formed and are organizing a campus-wide group around voter education for students. Um, I think we often forget as academics that the students who attend our campuses are often underrepresented at the polls and that um, as a social worker who thinks a lot about how to engage my, my clients, those are sort of my clients, I'm putting that in air quotes, but those are the people I work with and so I should be thinking about how to turn them out. So we have formed a campus campus-wide committee that involves um, everything from um, the Dean of Students Office to Residence Life to off-campus student services to uh, the computer IT support to faculty across the campus and we do campus-wide uh, really data-driven education and outreach events so for example one of the things we were hearing from students was that they um, traditional undergraduates literally did not know how to vote, that the process was mysterious to them, and particularly this year with absentee ballots. And in Minnesota, when you have to return the absentee ballot, it comes with about four envelopes and you need to like put things in envelopes and put them in more envelopes and send them back. And so we have um, made a YouTube video of how to return your absentee ballot that we're then pushing out in social media channels that the students look at that I don't know what they are, but we have some student interns who are telling us which ones to use and I trust them. Um, and so we're doing some sort of campus-wide organizing and that is being like, run through the School of Social Work in large part because social workers, as we all know, are excellent organizers and identifiers of systems. Um, at a more meso level within my College of Health, we've been drawing really strongly on the uh, Vote ER and the Voting and Social Work campaign to do outreach more specifically to College of Health faculty, students, and staff around the healthcare implications of voting so whether that's designing tools that go on our internal websites for example we created a flyer and a link that everyone can put on their um, their class management software we use canvas but you know whether you use blackboard or whatever you use at your university that can be just integrated into that site so if you're teaching a class in the College of Health that link can be made available to every class just click here if you want to update your voter registration, uh, that kind of information. And so we've sort of tailored that with a healthcare spin because we are a college of health. So we have focused on that. And then at a more micro level within the School of Social Work and within um, the undergraduate program, we certainly have drawn um, a lot from the wonderful materials that have already been discussed by, by Beth and by Tanya um, that have been developed by the Voting and Social Work Campaign for Field Sites. We also have a multi-part project that has been offered in our um, undergraduate social policy class uh, since 2015 um, that um, has become just a standard part of the undergrad policy curriculum. We work really closely with the Minnesota Secretary of State to have some non partisan voter engagement training built into the class um, and then sort of tie the class project to the three stages of, of voter outreach so registration engagement and education and turnout so it also falls in an academic calendar pretty nicely um, and we work to educate students about some of the specific challenges that are faced by um, populations and communities that social workers work with. Students then get into small groups, they pick a community, they design an outreach project that they then carry out over the course of their policy class. And then um, have we, the class coincidentally meets on Tuesdays, so we don't have class on election day because they are required to spend the day turning out that community that they've been working with 
over the course of the semester. Um, we found that it works really nicely to link with a lot of those other policy practice skills, strategic planning, assessment, evaluation. Um, you know, it makes it very, very concrete for students who I think often think policy work is, you know, we decided to change the law, so we did um, kind of situation. And this makes it really, really concrete for them, sort of how to think about it um, and the various steps that are engaged, where to go research information, how to build those community partnerships, how to create a strategic plan to do the work. Um, and so we also have those class-based activities here at St. Thomas. Um, the last thing I would say is just that these, these various levels all feed each other. So for example, something that we found when we were working with the students in the undergraduate class was that students, our campus is fairly large and it's actually in two different precincts. So students vote in two different places depending on which residence halls they live in, which is just if you are a traditional undergrad 19 it's the first time you voted like that that is enough to make you not do it if you're not going to the same place that your friends are going to that is enough to make you not do that and so we were then able to take that information feed it back to the larger campus-wide organization and say how can we start doing some strategic planning around education outreach and transportation uh, to the voting locations, the polling places, because one of them is on campus and one of them is, you know, three blocks off campus, but it's off campus. So it might as well be in another, another city entirely. Um, so we're really fortunate that we're able to sort of draw connections between all of those three areas. So that is what we were doing at St. Thomas. That's wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, it sounds like you guys are busy. So we're glad that you could join us and, and just give us some insights on Hopefully what other programs can take away from this and, and implement, even though we have just a short amount of time before voter registrations close, you know, these are ideas that uh, can be implemented anywhere. So thank you very much. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Barbara Arnwine. She is the president and founder of the Transformative Justice Coalition, and she also serves as co-chair and facilitator of the National Commission for Voter Justice. She is internationally renowned for her contributions on critical justice issues, including the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1991 and the reauthorization of provisions of the Voting Rights Act in 2006. You can also hear her regularly on Igniting Change with Barbara Arnwine on Radio One. Uh, again, we are thrilled to have her with us today. So welcome, Barbara, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I unfortunately have another meeting backing in of, of organizers that are waiting. So I'm going to you know, be brief, but I do want to just thank everybody. I'm so excited. I was so happy to see the website and to hear all the prior presentations. Uh, really great, amazing work. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gina McClendon, for having, uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. I'm going to just share my screen for just a quick minute uh, to make a few quick points uh, that I think you'll find of interest. Uh, and I love, you know, that there's so many students watching. Uh, this is just a presentation I give about the fight for uh, voting rights. Uh, because there's uh, certain things people should know about the fight for voting rights. Uh, but before I get to that, I just wanted everyone to know this is Voting Rights Month. Uh, you know, September 1st through uh, October 6th, which is Fannie Lou Hamer's birthday, we call it Voting Rights Month. It's congressionally uh, introduced every year, uh, sought to be passed all the way through, you know, both houses of Congress. But basically, it's an attempt to make sure that everybody knows that they need to be registered, uh, uh, use, you know, the vote.org tools and know, you know, especially in this virus voter suppression era, uh, how critical it is uh, to, you know, get your best information and to be uh, involved. This, um, this right here is what I call the voting rights circle. Um, and basically, I use this as a teaching tool. And it's, it goes into the history of the fight for voting uh, for African Americans in this country. And what it points out is that we're basically dealing with a cycle of from vote denial to vote denial. 
uh, that in the 1600s when African Americans came to this uh, country as enslaved Africans that immediately upon people becoming free, they sought the right to vote. So we're not talking about a century old fight, we're talking about centuries, four centuries of battles uh, for the right to vote. And in the colonies, the rights were you know, dispersed and were different. And we all know, you know that there was a civil war uh, that was eventually, that had to be fought and about the consequences of that. But even after reconstruction in the civil rights war, I mean, in the civil war, we had uh, the whole um, vote suppression that destroyed the black vote, destroyed black uh, reconstruction and set up what became the whole framework for the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And if you saw Good Trouble, on uh, this last Sunday, you saw John Lewis's study, a story of his fight for that right to vote. I just wanted to, you know, really remind people that since, uh, you know, the 2000 with Bush versus Gore, but more recently with the Shelby case and with, uh, you know, the results of the 2010 election and all those home, uh, houses that is of, of let state legislatures changing um, power that we saw you know, a really ugly you know, uh, period of voter suppression that has been sweeping this country. And in fact, uh, currently there are 61 forms of voter suppression uh, that we deal with. These are just you know, slides about the fight uh, for the vote you know, and the uh, misnomers around uh, the women's suffrage movement of people calling the 19th Amendment the amendment that gave women a right. No, not quite. Uh, Black women, uh, Native American women, and Latinas had to fight a lot longer for that right to vote. Uh, just some of the Black suffragists who you know, engage in that fight uh, so brilliantly, so gorgeously. Uh, and of course, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Uh, one thing people don't get, uh, when we talk about voter suppression, people forget that it was violent, that it was uh, massacres. Uh, the, this is just a chart of some of the black massacres. Uh, when I say massacres, I mean the destruction of black people, genocidal efforts that were genocidal um, you know, campaigns that were launched by whites to kill blacks uh, for voting. And in Okachi in 1920, 52 black people just murdered for voting. Uh, in Wilmington, 1901, the coup uh, that you know, killed people. Uh, Colfax, hundreds killed. I mean, Elaine, I mean, all of these stories that go to the fight for the vote that people don't talk about. And you know why it's relevant to us today? It's turned out that people have done studies as recently as 2018 in which they have shown that if you are in an area that had a lynching or had one of these massacres, that the black vote is still to this day depressed in those areas. That black turnout because of racial memory, because of the inheritance of that era is still with us. Uh, amazing you know, to see how that affects us. And then we're just in the modern era of vote suppression. This is when I created the map of shame in 2011 uh, to tell people about voter suppression and people told me to shut up and not use that term, that, uh, that it wasn't fair. We had a new black president. Surely we were post-racial. Surely we had achieved a, a new level of racial understanding. And I was saying, no, look at these laws that have been introduced in 40 states, uh, over 100 voter restriction laws, and nobody wanted to hear it. And now, of course, everybody talks about voter suppression. I'm so glad uh, that it's now become a legitimate term and it's no longer a quote, a quote conspiracy term. And uh, instead of people telling me to shut up, they want to tell me they created the term. But that's a whole new world. Uh, here's the Shelby case. Uh, and uh, of course, the Shelby case did damage to the Voting Rights Act, and we're still suffering from that damage. Um, 61 forms of voter suppression. Uh, it's our new reality. You can see this at votingrightsalliance.org. Uh, you can find this, uh, votingrightsalliance.org. It's our main site. Um, and then this is just the current era of COVID-induced uh, 
virus voter suppression that we're living under and what do we do about it? Uh, and uh, you know, where, what can we do and some of the impacts of uh, you know, the current era. But what I wanna do is go back uh, to one of the earlier slides. I'm not sophisticated enough to know how to do this uh, without having to slide back all the way through. Um, but I wanted to uh, just point out a couple things that I hope that everybody will do while we're in this uh, particular uh, time, uh, because everybody's efforts are so needed and there's already been so many ways that people have talked to you about ways that you can help. Uh, but I wanted to show this. Uh, this is the John Lewis Good Trouble Voter Awareness March series that we have started all over the country. This is from little old Danville, Virginia, uh, where we had a march uh, on se um, September the 19th, the day after early voting started in the state of Virginia, to really make people aware that early voting has started because the first message out of your voice, to, out of your mouth to any voter right now should be vote early vote early. There is no alternative to voting early. And it was just decided yesterday in Wisconsin that they don't care what your postmark is for your mail-in ballot. It has to be received in the hands of the Board of Elections and stamped by Election Day. So vote early is everything in this country. And we have to really make sure that every voter knows that. So we are getting out there whenever early voting starts. We're in the streets. We're doing motorcades, marches, rallies, anything to make people aware that they have to vote early. And let's be honest, right now, people are in trouble. Uh, if people have not requested their mail-in ballot, uh, at this point, time is running out. Uh, the time for them to receive it, uh, to get it to the uh, Board of Elections, to receive it on time and to vote it on time and return it on time, all of that is running. We're telling people that if you have not returned your ballot by October the 13th, vote in person. Just take it with you and take it to the polling site, turn that rascal in and vote in person because there's no time. Uh, you know, and realistically, that means that we got to back ourselves up to how do we do that? And when I say we, of course, the Voting Rights Alliance, uh, that's what we're telling people. Uh, disabilities, three million people with disabilities didn't vote in 2016 because of barriers, because of the lack of accommodations. We gotta be their advocates. And it's not just the physical accommodations, it's the lack of the right voting equipment, et cetera. There is no state at this time that's ranked in total compliance when it comes to providing accommodations for people who are not cited in this entire country. That's how bad we are. Uh, there's not one state that has a total compliance uh, written across its uh, mandates when it comes to uh, voting um, accommodations for people with disabilities. The newly unhoused, uh, the eviction crisis is huge and that's something you're all seeing because I see it on the streets of Washington, D.C. every day when I come to work. And I just want people to know, and we're all seeing, you know, more homelessness. And that's a huge question about making sure that their rights to vote are protected because they are entitled to vote. And so we have to make sure that we're doing that. We did an entire Twitter storm on this last Friday. I encourage you to look at it. The formerly incarcerated people with felony convictions, 17 million. 17 million people who are formerly incarcerated have no clue that they have the right to vote. Uh, who in their states, let me be clear, there are 20 states that have no barriers that, and there are 31 states that have significant barriers. But for those 20 states, in those 20 states, 17 million people are entitled to vote, but because they read about the other states and they see Florida and they see Iowa and they see Kentucky and they see all Texas, you know, putting people in jail for voting, North Carolina putting people in jail for voting. They think, they think that's uh, them. So they don't even try to vote. They don't even try to register, but think about it if they did, if they did participate. Also, I just want to end by saying, you know, we run, uh, we help to run the election protection pro uh, program 
Uh, again, uh, if people are encountering problems trying to vote, uh, they need help. They should be calling that election protection hotline, the 866-HOUR-VOTE hotline. They should be calling it for polling locations. They should be calling it if they got uh, challengers at the polls. And we know that the RNC put out a public announcement. And, uh, I'm not making stuff up. They said publicly that they're going to put 50,000 challengers uh, at black and brown polling sites. So you're going to encounter people who are really frustrated because they don't know what to do because they have, you know, these people out there disrupting the elections. The last thing, period, is the high rates of ballot rejection. Voter education is everything. Uh, right now, we're seeing tremendously high rates of ballot rejection for African Americans throughout the country. And the same is true of Latino uh, voters. Uh, that we're seeing uh, something in North Carolina, the last count I saw was a week ago and it was, uh, was uh, last Friday, and it was 5% of all black ballots being cast or being rejected uh, because of, of all kinds of errors. So when you are talking to people about voting, besides saying vote early, besides saying the urgency of it, besides talking about people uh, preparing themselves safely to go to the polls, you've got to also be talking to them about carefully following those instructions. Remember, the majority of people voting by mail have never done it before. So they don't understand that if it says black ink, that means black ink. It means the scanner can't read anything but black ink. If they tell you to fill in the whole bubble, you better, or the scanner can't read it. It's going to kick out your ballots. Uh, if, it, if it says, I mean, and then it doesn't tell you stuff that people do anyway, like that you can't make extraneous markings on your ballot. You can't write a moji. You can't do go say go, go Kamala, or, you know, I hate you, whoever. You can't do it because the ballot scanner reads that as an error and kicks it out. Uh, you can't put your husband and wife's ballots together in the same envelope. They got to be in each individual envelope as sent. I mean, so people are making these errors, huge errors. And as a consequence, they're rejecting these ballots. And people are signing because, you know, people got these different signatures. Uh, you got your formal signature that's all flourish. And you got your other signature that's your early, every day signature. But you got states like North Carolina, and others that will totally throw your ballot out and put it in the trash if your signature doesn't match the one on file. And it's totally insane because people's signatures change anyway, but that's the state law. And these courts are upholding this stuff every day when I look at it. Uh, and there are hundreds of lawsuits right now in this country over these issues and these rules. So I wanna just encourage everyone Voter education is everything, everything you can do to occupy space, to reach out to everybody you can to educate them about the right to vote is key. And just thank you so much. You know, of course I could say more, but I won't. I wanna thank you for this great program. I wanna thank you for being social workers. I have such tremendous love and respect for social workers. Uh, I could tell a whole story about how social workers changed my life. Uh, but that's an entirely different uh, story. But my heart you know, goes out to people who have taken on this mission in life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for uh, pointing out those great facts that we should all be taking back to our colleagues, uh, to our classmates. And you know, it's really important. Something that you said um, sparked in my uh, head the idea of, you know, we are, oh, we are voting now. Polls are open in many states. So we really need to start working quickly, organize some efforts to not only drive people to register, but then to get people to the polls. Thank you again for, uh, for being with us today. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our final speaker. Uh, Terry Mizrahi is Professor Emeritus with the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College, and she is with the Voting as Social Work campaign. And Terry, we'd like you to just say a couple of closing remarks before we get into uh, some Q&A. Thank you very much. Great. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much. I love being the last and to be able to say that goodbye. 
everything was said. But you know I won't do that in five minutes or so. But I will say that redundancy is reinforcement. So everything that you heard today, um, if you heard it more than once and you'll continue to, is why it's so essential. And Barbara was extraordinarily important. Um, I have a PhD, my son and my daughter, and we took 35 minutes to fill out an absentee ballot because we, our hands were shaking to make sure that all of those steps you had to go through were right. So it, this is, goes way beyond a particular community, um, even though it, it disproportionately affects that. So I want to say that you, with the number of students on and, and having reached a part of today, almost 250 folks and probably more than 300 folks registered, uh, it's so exciting to be there. I won't take my time by, again, rethanking everybody who, who has done a great job in bringing this together. And we're going to continue, keep looking. You'll be on our list. Please, as we heard, sign up. We will count everyone and we want to count this effort. We want to make sure that it, it has a real big bang um, on election day, election night, and after uh, for the registration. We are nonpartisan and the students need to know that politics is not a dirty word. And we are just separating out for our campaign, unlike Barbara's, I want us to make sure, unlike what I'll say in a minute about NASW's PACE campaign, we are nonpartisan as a profession. We never tell anybody who to vote for, which party to register for, but we tell everybody it's their obligation, not just a privilege to have your clients and constituents and yourself registered and ready to go to those polls and to do it this this um, November. And particularly the, the folks who following John Lewis with all those students carrying it on uh, where we started off today. Just a couple of things to, to highlight and then look at questions for those who can stay on. We certainly can. Uh, that for those of you in five states, I'm mentioning those five states now, Wisconsin, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina and Arizona, their NASW has a partisan campaign going. And if you're part of NASW or get to the state chapter, there is an organizer working to get out the votes in those five states for the candidate that NASW has endorsed. So that's extremely important um, to know for those five states, but partisan is different from politics. Um, and we want everybody uh, engaged in this effort. We started in 2016 a moment and it's gone to a movement um, now. And the moment was when in 2016 at Silverman, we learned in New York City that 60% of our students in the field told us the agencies did nothing. And boy, did nothing for the campaign. I'm hoping that's turned around, turns on its head that all of you on are gonna make sure that your agencies, what it did was arouse our students, anger them, and they became the change agents that we heard for in terms of the field and getting students because the hub is the connection. Not only are students and field instructors, but the field instructors reach everybody in those agencies. And that's the, the ripple effect that this campaign has had since um, 2016 and 2018. We joined in 2016 because the voter our website was already up by Tanya and her colleagues. So this is a true and continuing growing breadth and depth for an infrastructure of social workers to stay engaged. As we heard from Gina, uh, um, I think, or Barbara, wasn't just voting for Obama, right? It's way, way beyond that. And it's happening, as Patrick said, as we speak. I want to say, that we have two things that can happen that if you feel comfortable, Sandra and Darla, it's amazing that you're giving your workers time off. Many schools are doing it. Whether you have school, don't make it, it's not a day of absence, it's a day of engagement. And give those alternative assignments in the classroom, whether you're excusing your student, you're not excusing them to do their laundry or do their paper, but you're giving credit for them doing something that gets themselves and others to vote if they haven't already by November 3rd. 
So I want to say that we're available. Those of you who are on, we can't promise, but many of us are available to do a virtual speaking engagement. If you want to invite us, we will try to accommodate one of our leadership team here to, to um, be part of any student-wide or agency-wide effort that you're doing between now and November 3rd. We really want to make sure that this is an all-in effort and that we wind up uh, being proud and we want to know what you're doing. Please tell us online, please go at our, when you sign on to our um, voting a social work website, now tell us that you pledge to participate. We want to ask you what you've done. We hope to accumulate those thousands, and there are thousands now, uh, 800 schools multiplied by the number of students and field instructor, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of social workers. Um, to reach those 12 million clients that uh, Mimi may mentioned in the beginning. So we know you stayed on with us. We thank you and we thank our profession and what it will do was put our profession at the table. Yes, we're at the door. We've been marching, we've been protesting, we've been writing letters. So go from protest to polls and after the polls, back to protest as needed, but get to the table. We're, we're gonna wanna be at the door, knocking when we've, those voter suppression items come up, and then also at the table to change them as we go beyond uh, 2020. So thank you very much, everybody. If we can stay on, we're all happy to, however, um, folks at CSWE to answer any questions of the few and for sure you know you can reach any of us going forward so move Thank on you, move. I think we have time for just two questions so I'd like to bring in Marianne Varchiani she is CSWE's communications and marketing manager and has been instrumental to getting this webinar up uh, and off the ground today so Marianne I know you've been keeping an eye on the questions if you could throw a couple out to the panel then uh, panelists uh, weigh in with any answers or points uh, so I know we've received a lot of questions so far about just the session recording and the PowerPoint slides. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that the recording will be uploaded to CSWE's YouTube channel. And we're going to send that out to all the registered attendees following the conclusion of this webinar. Um, we will check with the speakers on the slides and see if we're able to share something with you all. Um, that being said, I haven't really seen any Ooh, we do have a question here from Ashley. She says, when should we see our ballots? Um, so who wants to take that question? Or Ashley, would you clarify a little bit what you meant by that? Um, she said, when should we see our ballots in the mail? So, um, who would like to take that question? She's located in Ohio. Um, Go ahead, Tanya. Well, it's different in every state. You're in Ohio. Um, I know in Connecticut, we mail it in um, 30, 30, we are required by law to mail it within 30 days. Um, I'm just looking at Ohio at the map. It uh, doesn't say. I'll find out the information on Ohio and send it to you in the chat. And I know there are some people um, in the chat and I don't know which states they're in, but they're saying they've already received theirs. And I'm in Virginia and I've also already received mine, if that's helpful at all for anybody. Um, we have an anonymous question. Someone is asking, what practical actions can student social work groups take to promote voting on campus, especially in the era of COVID? So if our, okay, Mimi. Well, I think um, you've heard a lot of them on this uh, discussion today, although we did went on, you know, quickly. But if, it, if this is recorded and you can hear it, you can slow it down and listen to the examples. But also that's exactly what the website is for. If you go to the website, there's all sorts of information. Uh, if you look at the general leaflet about what you can do, there's something called Cindy, it was a 10 ways that you can, mobilize on campus it's it's too hard to 
detail them all now, we don't have the time, but we really have spent a lot of time getting that information on the website so you can actually look at it at your leisure. So I really recommend you do that. Well, I just thought I would also mention that there is the Institute for Democracy in Higher Education that is also worth looking at. They've got a fabulous website. And so this has all been about engaging social work students and faculty and staff, but there's a broader effort around engaging students across all disciplines and majors in democracy. And so I would also encourage you to look at that particular website for that question. And if I could add something, I would also say in terms of COVID, we have this QR code on the website. So you can uh, copy that, put it on your social media. You can uh, put pictures of that QR code around campus if you are on campus, and that'll link people right to the site and they can register to vote. Um, and so we're just going to take one last question, and I just Hi, want to, can I just, I want to add something. This is Terry. Just, social work just, website. Um, so one last question. Um, someone is saying many potential voters say they don't know enough of either candidate. Do we know of any unbiased information that we can provide to help individuals feel comfortable about the information they're receiving to make an informed decision? Cindy, did you want to take that, or Tanya? I was going to say Ballotpedia, right, Tanya? Is that the site where people can go to? Yeah, it's easier. Um, actually, I've seen some things on Frontline and on NPR. They're trying to do more nonpartisan guy um, video um, documentaries as well, Ballotpedia. And I encourage all of you to in, take a look at what's available for your down ballot races. Vote for one, vote for one, one by the League of Women Voters is also a great resource for looking up state um, uh, candidates for General Assembly or state legislatures. And sometimes the um, many municipalities will have information there as well. But look in yours because finding information on candidates, particularly on down ballot races, is really hard to find, especially in communities that um, are underserved in other ways. So um, and really important to connect um, clients and communities to nonpartisan information. Thank you, Tanya. Well, thank you all again for taking time to join us today on behalf of the Council of Social Work Education, on behalf of Voting as Social Work, and on behalf of all of our panelists. I want to thank you again for joining us. And uh, please check us out on YouTube for a recording of this and visit the Voting as Social Work website for any resources to help drive voters to register and to the polls. So thank you so much again. And it's been a pleasure having you with us. So long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.